It's my honour, Mr. Speaker, in support of this motion by the member from Chateauguay, Saint, Saint Constant. Um, I think it's very important to reiterate what the motion says because we will be voting on this motion. It's important for Canadians to be watching and seeing the very specific measures that we're simply asking all the members of this House to support so that, in fact, we can provide the best possible support to our veterans who have served and, uh, and in, in honour. And that motion simply calls for the House, uh, uh, for the men and women who bravely served Canada in the Armed Forces, to be able to count on the government for support in their time of need and that the government should demonstrate this support by immediately addressing the mental health crisis facing Canadian soldiers and veterans by hiring appropriate mental health professionals. Secondly, to reverse the decisions to close the veterans' offices, which they have decided to close. And third, Mr. Speaker, to prioritize and conclude the over 50 outstanding boards of inquiry on the military suicide so that the grieving families may have answers and closure. Mr. Speaker, I think there's a very reasonable request uh, those requests come from uh, those who have served and their families. And uh, I wish also to add, Mr. Speaker, my condolences to the families who have recently suffered uh, through these suicides. Um, on behalf of their families and our veterans, I request all members to support this motion. Mr. Speaker, we send our armed forces into conflict and dire circumstances. They witness the atrocities of war. Any ordinary person would probably suffer some kind of mental trauma from this. It's important that we, the members of Parliament, are here to stand up for them and ensure that the appropriate medical services are there when they return, whether those are minor concerns, whether they may lead to post-traumatic stress disorder or other problems. Uh, many who suffer mental problems also may uh, suffer physical disabilities because of the impact that it has on, on their health and on their families. And so um, we are imploring, Mr. Speaker, that all the members of this House carefully consider this motion and the reasonable requests. In the least, this is what we can do for our veterans. Um, many of those most recently deployed to Afghanistan um, have served not just one but numerous deployments. And so they have been subjected to considerable stress. Uh, I and uh, my constituents and all Edmontonians recognize and are extremely grateful and proud of their contribution and in particular at the Edmonton Garrison, CFB Edmonton, for their service continuously in the mission to Afghanistan particularly. Um, I had the privilege of participating in the recent memorial to their service, the installation at City Hall. And uh, I've had the honor as well of attending with the former Minister of Defence to one of the repatriation ceremonies at Petawawa. Um, I can share with you that is an extremely uh, emotional experience and brings home very clearly the sacrifice made, not just by our soldiers, but their families who are left behind. Um, it is absolutely critical that we provide the best possible first-rate um, health services to our armed forces. My father, I served in World War II in the Air Force. Um, I suspect I never had the chance, Mr. Speaker, to speak with my father because unlike many of his friends, he chose not to discuss the war. And so I suspect in his time, in his generation, this was something that they kept to themselves if they were stressed by the experience. I regret now that I didn't take that opportunity. But many of his, his uh, friends and the colleagues who fought, members of our family circle, often have regaled us as children growing up with their tales of the war. Uh, one of them particularly was a hero and was a fighter pilot uh, shot down and, and interned. So I'm fully aware of what, what occurred in those wars. I unfortunately did not meet my great uncle who served in World, World War I because he gave his life in, in that war. So a lot of contribution by my family. I grew up being very proud of our armed forces and continue to be honored that they, are, they serve uh, in, my, uh, in my city. We are, of course, home to uh, 5,000 military personnel and their families. And so it's important that I stand up on their behalf and seek the best possible supports for them. Um, at the start of the Afghan mission, 750 troops from the 3rd Battalion of Princess Patricia's Canadian Light Infantry deployed, and they continue to serve and have continued to serve through that mission. Um, as my colleagues have shared, Veterans should not have to return home again to fight for the health and financial benefits 
that uh, are, they, they should be awarded. And so it's critical that as the members of this House that we stand up and hold the government accountable for making sure those services are provided in a timely fashion. Um, I certainly have been absolutely uh, appalled at the stance of this government. These aren't the only lawsuits. They seem to have a propensity for wanting to take uh, uh, Canadians to court instead of simply delivering on the services that they should be uh, delivering. And of course, there was the extended uh, lawsuit that was dragged out, costing many millions of dollars. And the veterans finally uh, won that case and ended the clawback of their disability benefits. As my colleagues have mentioned, a second lawsuit on the fiduciary responsibility of the government to its military is now proceeding. And we highly recommend that the government back off on the wasting of Canadian dollars on fighting our armed forces and courts and instead simply extend the benefits that they, they deserve. The recent, the recent suicides is indeed a tragedy, a tragedy that could potentially be avoided. We're not saying absolutely that uh, the lack of the services is directly the cause, but any additional health services that can be provided will help to avoid a tragedy. Many in this House have previously spoken in this place about the suicides that have been suffered in their own families and have implored that all of us stand up for more attention to uh, supports in mental health. And I may note, Mr. Speaker, that just issued by the Library of Parliament is a report talking about the current issues with mental health in Canada. And they say that uh, one of the solutions proposed is more funding for mental health promotion and investment would likely produce long-term savings. Well, Mr. Speaker, not just savings in dollars, but savings in lives. And uh, very clearly, this is one of those areas where we need to be giving greater attention. Clearly, given the rise in the number of, su of suicides in our veterans, there is an issue. And it's not enough simply to say to the veterans, well, they should be reaching out. My experience with those who are suffering uh, mental health distress is that we need to be watching over those people, whether in their family, whether our neighbours, and whether they are armed forces. And so clearly we need additional measures. And there are a number of measures that have been recommended by uh, uh, the Veterans Ombudsman, a number of measures recommended formally by parliamentary committees and certainly in this House today, and I encourage all members to give due consideration. First of all, we need to reverse the cuts to the veterans' offices. Um, I run into this all the time, Mr. Speaker where whether we're asking for health studies or the impact of industrial activities, any kind of activity that is going on in rural areas, we're often told, well, the concentration of the population is not enough to justify the expenditure or the action. I think that what we need to make sure is that even if they are small offices in a rural area, um, it's important that those citizens also have equal access to those services. So I look forward to assurances that they're not uh, uh, missing those kinds of services simply because they're not near a major centre. And we have to remember that a lot of our uh, First Nation peoples also serve in the armed forces and they very often live in rural areas not close to major centres. And uh, as some of my members have reminded us, Mr. Speaker, um, the armed forces, uh, our veterans, are unilateral federal responsibility. And so there is a deep concern, for example, with the hospitals and the long-term care centres, such as the Kipnis Centre in Edmonton, which I'm very proud exists. It's a fantastic uh, centre. It's very important that right now we think about the future for those, those services. Uh, we have a good number of veterans returning home. Um, as we've lost uh, the World War I veterans and we are slowly losing the World War II veterans and will not be using those services anymore, it's important that those kinds of high quality services be available to all of our veterans. They should all be held equal in the way that we treat them when they return. And uh, uh, a very dear friend of my uh, father's was living at the Kipnis Center and I had a chance to visit him there. Um, but he was very upset because his wife, who was not a member of the armed uh, services, could not live with him and therefore entered into a deep depression. So I think there are a lot of policies that merit perhaps looking into again. And uh, with a small uh, expenditure of monies, we may actually be able to serve uh, our veterans in a, in a, in a better way um, regardless. Um, I think a 1-800 number is just not sufficient. Uh, I get complaints all the time in my office uh, to 1-800 numbers for other services such as pensions, such as immigration and so forth. Let's make sure the veterans are better looked after. Um, 
So um, I think you're telling me my time is drawing near, Mr. Speaker. Um, I would just like to close uh, with a quote um, from the member for Sackville Eastern Shore that he shared with us uh, before the Christmas break. And it was on the tombstone of a fallen Canadian World War I soldier, and it says, this Canadian soldier left his home so that you could live in yours. And so, Mr. Speaker, I think that's something for us to keep in mind. It's very important that we make sure that these services are available to all of our veterans. Thank you. Uh, questions and comments. The Honourable Member for Scarborough, Age and Court. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I um, want to thank my colleague for her eloquent um, comments. Um, I had a, um, a situation where I needed to call Veterans Affairs, so I called 411, got the number. I'm going to share this with my colleague and get her comments. And the number after 430 said, thank you for calling Veterans Affairs. If this is an emergency, dial 911 or go to the closest hospital. So a vet suffering post-traumatic stress disorder, and, and there's a lot of triggers there, sitting at home contemplating suicide. He calls that number. I'm just wondering if my colleague has any thoughts, has anything to share, how this vet will react. For Edmonton Strathcona. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank the Honourable Member for his question. Um, I am personally looking forward to tomorrow. I'm traveling with the member from Sackville Eastern Shore to Edmonton, and we're meeting with a number of veterans' uh, organizations. And uh, I am hoping that I will not hear those kinds of stories, but if I do, the response that I would make is, as I've mentioned in my brief uh, comments here today, Mr. Speaker, it isn't for the veterans to be reaching out simply and seeking help. It's our obligation as Canadians. It's the obligation of the government to ensure that they reach out to each and every soldier who returns home from any mission and to make sure that they follow through any kind of suggestion. It's important that they reach out to the families of the veterans and to watch for any kind of concern. Simply calling a uh, uh, 1-800 line is not appropriate in the case of somebody under mental distress. Question and comment. Mr. Speaker. Uh, as the Member of Parliament for La Salle et Mar, I have the pleasure of having in my riding uh, Legion, uh, Royal Canadian Legion Branch 2, 212, uh, where there's about 77 uh, veterans that frequent, uh, frequently go to the Legion as a meeting place, as uh, getting together and sharing stories. And quite often also hardship. Also, I had the pleasure of uh, participating in their Christmas dinner where 150 people uh, were present as showing support. There's a lot of different activities to support our veterans. And what I have noticed is the relationship amongst veterans, but also amongst the volunteers of the legions that, uh, that have. And what I would like to ask my colleague is I feel that the, the lack of personalized service uh, to the veterans will be very detrimental to the care of the people. And I was wondering if in her writing, she feels that the veterans will be affected by the lack of personalized uh, assiduous services for veterans for Edmonton Strathcona. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank the Honourable Member uh, for sharing with the, us in the House for her question and for sharing with us how active uh, the Legion is in, in her community. In my riding, unfortunately, the, the Legion has been suffering, trying to maintain, and they're stressed simply trying to uh, keep a service available for the veterans to come forward. We have a whole new group, though, uh, post-World War II, of the veterans who have served overseas, and including Afghanistan. And uh, I think it's very important for us to recognize that, in fact, the numbers of our veterans are not declining. In fact, we have a good number of veterans. And while they have not come out of a World War I, they're going to need similar uh, personal support. And certainly we're seeing that with the suicides from uh, the recently deployed soldiers. So absolutely, there should be personal service, but I would suggest that that needs to be very early on and followed through, not waiting until a crisis point. Uh, nous avons un temps pour un bref.
We have time for one brief question. The Honorable Member for beauport Limoilou. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Uh, speaker, and I'd like to thank my colleague from Edmonton Strathcona for her remarks. Quickly then, the president of the union for veterans has made a comment and he said, how can one person replace 13 qualified people who look after over 4,000 clients. Mr. Speaker, it's already remarkable that a qualified staff member at VAC can look after th some 300 uh, different cases. What does my colleague think about the fact that it will be reduced to down to one person for over 4,000 clients to help these uh, veterans? In Strathcona. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank the Honourable Member for his very cogent question. Well, obviously, uh, that is a, not a good direction to go in. Uh, we're advised that there are at least 100 vacancies uh, in the mental health positions in Veterans Affairs. And I know myself from being a senior civil servant that you have the opportunity to set priorities on your hiring. And we would certainly encourage, in fact, our motion calls for that, is that Department of Veterans Affairs step up the pace on the hiring of these mental health workers. It's the least that we can do and then move forward and examine additional strategies. Right. 